Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. When I was eight years old, I started doing what every eight-year-old would do, and that is try to save up as many quarters and coins as you could. And of course, searching laundry, searching dryers, couches. I'm not the only one, right? <laughs> you know, when you don't have a job, you got to do whatever you got to do. And, you know, thank God for grandmothers. Every visit, I got some money from grandma. And I had, uh, I think Crystal Light was around this long ago. It had to be some, it was like some kind of plastic container. I remember being crystal light because my family tried to have sugar-free stuff. Um, and I remember cutting a hole in the top of this crystal light container to put all my coins in. And if I got some dollars to put in there. And I was telling this story to my small group on Friday night. I think I may have accidentally said the wrong amount, but I think I was around $12 or so. I know I had enough to buy a couple of GI Joes, you know. Does that age me a little bit? <laughs> I thought, hey, I have a few Hot Wheels cars in this thing. And like every eight-year-old who thinks they're rich when they get a little bit of money, I started spreading it out on my bed, and I started counting the coins and just, you know, seeing how much money I had. And I put it away, and then I, I heard a whisper. But it wasn't like a, a whisper like I heard. I, I, I had this, this idea, this thought planted in my heart that I couldn't get rid of. And that's how I know it's the Holy Spirit. I didn't know it then, but the Holy Spirit was speak, speaking to me then. And he said, I want you to give that to me. And of course, as an eight-year-old, you can just kind of see um, in your mind G.I. Joe's or you giving over this container and just kind of see the G.I. Joe's disappear. And I remember being in my room, and, and God was like, I want you to give me all of it. Take it to kids' church. Give it all. And so I'm not sure how many weeks it took me to do that. <laughs> but eventually I remember going, uh, at this time, kids' church, ready for this? It was in the education wing we have upstairs in 205 way at the end of the hallway. And I remember even where I was, I was sitting on the right side and I, and I brought the container and I poured everything in to that bucket. It would be four years later, around 12 years old, where my youth pastor is preaching a message from Isaiah saying, here am I, send me. The Lord was saying, who will go for me? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. And that same feeling came to me right here and here. And, and it, was, it was, give me your life this time. Give me everything. And it was that day where I decided to give my life to serve God and to be whatever God has called me to be. It would be later that I would find out I'd be a pastor. But I just had to say yes to saying, God, you're calling me to give my all to you. So everything belongs to you. I give you my life to serve you. Do with me what you please. My life has never been the same since. There was an immense and intense joy that came over my life that night. Every sadness, every discouragement was just flushed out by a spirit of joy. Some people wonder, why do people laugh so hysterically sometimes when they're in the presence of God when it's rich? It's because the joy of the Lord comes in you. See, at 12 years old, I was already feeling depression and discouragement because of how I looked and how I felt. And I did not think I was able to do anything for God. And God even not just called me to ministry, but even fixed brokenness in my heart. And I'll never forget that day because it was that day where Everything changed for me, and I saw everything differently. And I didn't know it at the time when I was eight, and now I know it from studying the Bible, that that was the Holy Spirit, that was God's presence meeting me where I was. Today I'm in introducing you to the Holy Spirit, 
and we're in a sense getting to know him today and meeting him for the first time, maybe some of you, and maybe for some of us it's a refresher uh, and a reinforcement. But perhaps some of us have mi- had misconceptions, and I'm praying that we will be able to fix some of those misconceptions of the Holy Spirit throughout this series. And as always, you know my heart as a pastor that as believers we're called to make disciples. And so we always need a refresher. We always need to be reminded of the truth of God's word so that we can help other people follow Jesus. Amen? In fact, I review this stuff all the time so that I know I can be accurate and be uplifting and encouraging to those around me that I'm teaching. And it's because I make disciples and other make disciples that we continue to learn these things and refine and sharpen our knowledge of every topic in the Bible. And the person of the Holy Spirit is one that we must. And here's why. Uh, Years ago, Francis Chan wrote a book called, and I think this is a compelling and very sobering title for his book. He called it The Forgotten God, Reversing Our Tragic Neglect of the Holy Spirit. And Francis Chan in his book gives you a basic understanding and introduction of the Holy Spirit and how we have ignored him from our walk in Christianity. And one of the things that I've learned is we tend to neglect and underutilize what we don't understand. And if we don't understand the Holy Spirit's place in our lives, we risk neglecting, underappreciating, and missing out on the life-giving blessings that come from him. And if that's not enough to go, let's make sure we learn about the Holy Spirit through this series. How about a recent statistic that said 62% of born-again Christians do not believe the Holy Spirit is a person and he's just a force. Now, the survey was conducted with only 2,000 believers. I would like to have more of like a million on that one. But it's alarming that even out of 2,000, 62% don't even believe the Holy Spirit is a person. And that's okay because he hasn't been taught, so we need to teach him. And that's why today I start with the basic foundation of who the Holy Spirit is. And so I want to introduce you to, let's meet the Holy Spirit today. The Holy Spirit is what we call, and he's in a relationship with God, and he is called the Holy Spirit And he's in the Godhead, or what we know as the Trinity, as well. Now, I want to go to Matthew chapter 3, where we get a picture of of all three together at one time. And it happens many times in Scripture. Here's just one example. The baptism of Jesus Christ. So Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 says this, then Jesus went down from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. But John tried to talk him out of it. I am the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said, so why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, The heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my dearly loved Son who brings me great joy. In one moment, all three are present. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and his Spirit looked like a dove. It wasn't a dove. It looked like it. And then the voice of God present in that moment, authorizing and saying, this is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. The Trinity is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. God is one in purpose and yet has three expressions or persons who perform unique functions. Though there are three persons, there is only one God. And the Holy Spirit is unique but in a perfect and divine relationship with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And that's why we call them the Godhead. It's a fellowship that cannot be broken. They're all equal, but they all also have their unique identity. It's, to be honest with you, church, and anyone who's new or maybe an unbeliever, we can't explain God already, right? 
or we wouldn't be able to fully explain the Trinity either. The Bible refers to the Holy Spirit in different ways too. In certain places, they call him the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Jesus. Just so you know, when you read that in your scripture, they're talking about the Holy Spirit. And Romans 8, 9 even says God and Jesus Christ in the same line. Just to give you an idea, if you ever run into that in scripture, don't be alarmed. It's not a different spirit. It is the Holy Spirit they are referring to. In our Summaries of God Fundamental Truths, it says this, neither person in the Godhead exists or works separately or independently of the others. In other words, God's triune nature works in unity and cooperation with one another. Why would this matter? Because if you experience the Holy Spirit in some form or way, you're experiencing God and Jesus at the same time. Well, why would that matter? Well, it's good to know that the fullness of God is working in you. It's important to know that you're not getting a piece of God, you're getting all of God. He's so good that he's given us everything, his whole self to us. It's important to understand this because one is not better than the other. They are the same. So proper attention and respect for one is to ultimately honor and respect God. Why is that important? Let me go there. Because we've tragically neglected the person of the Holy Spirit and we focus on God and Jesus but neglect him. And so that can be disrespectful to God. Because all of God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And God has himself in the Holy Spirit. It's hard to grasp, isn't it? It can be a little much. But it's divine. It's, he, he is, I'm sorry, he is eternal. This relationship is divine. And he is eternal. And so it's so important that we understand that. Many metaphors and analogies have been used to try to describe the Holy Spirit. You know, I'm talking about the three forms of water, vapor or gas, ice and liquid. So solid, liquid and gas. That doesn't do justice, but it is a cool visual of trying to help you understand. No example really does justice for who he is because we just explain God as water instead of God as who he is, you know. That's the problem with those metaphors. But how do the three work at the same time? 1 Corinthians 12, it'll be on the screen for you, has an example of this. And it offers some insight into how they work together. And in this context, Paul's talking about the gifts of the Spirit. And he says this, there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord, Lord being Jesus. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. So working all those activities in all people. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Again, he's talking about these gifts that we would all have. So as we read this passage, we discover that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all serve different roles. The Father operates or initiates, the Son administrates, and the Holy Spirit manifests the presence of God through those gifts. That's how they all work at the same time. So it is important that if we are manifesting gifts, if we are using our spiritual gifts, which I look forward to getting that in our series, but I need to lay down a solid foundation of the Holy Spirit in our life first. But if we're using the gifts of the Spirit, that's why it's important that they're authentic and real and truly from God because God will be in it and he'll be in his spirit that we do it, not from our flesh. If you and I were going to build a house, what would we need to do? Here's an example. Again, an illustration, a metaphor doesn't completely do justice, but you would need to hire an architect, a foreman, and workers or subcontractors to actually build the house. In this illustration, God the Father is the architect, Jesus is the foreman, and the Holy Spirit is the workers or the contractors. All three roles are essential to construction of that building or that house. That's how they work. And at some point we have to give up trying to figure out how they work and just trust that they are all one. Now, just so you know, there are 
religions that would disagree with us because they think that we're now worshiping three different gods. This is not true. He is not three different gods. He's one God and three persons in a perfect relationship. We're accused in Christianity of being polytheistic, believing in many gods, and that is not true. We believe still in one true God. We're a theistic belief, one God, in three forms or persons, all working together. Now, the Holy Spirit is in the Godhead in relationship with God, but the Holy Spirit has his own identity as well. He is a person or a being. He's not a person as in a human, but he is a personal being. Anthony Palma, one of our seminary teachers for the Sundays of God, says the scriptures teach clearly that the Holy Spirit is a personal being. Yet some Christians under, misunderstand this, referring to the Spirit as it rather than he. So, so you know, we don't refer to the Holy Spirit as it. We refer to the Holy Spirit as he because he has personal attributes. The Holy Spirit has an identity, attributes, purpose, and even emotions. And this makes the Holy Spirit a personal divine presence we can relate to, not a force we use. And that is on the screen for you too. The Holy Spirit has an identity, attributes, purpose, and even emotions. This makes the Holy Spirit personal divine presence we can relate to, not a force that we use. I like Star Wars, but the Holy Spirit is not the force in Star Wars, just so you know. In Romans 8, we see that the Holy Spirit has a mind. In 1 Corinthians 12, he has a will. In Romans 15, he has emotions such as love and joy. Galatians 5, he comforts, or I'm sorry, Acts 9, he comforts. He speaks according to Hebrews 3 and 1 Timothy 4. He teaches according to 1 Corinthians 2. He can be made to feel sorrow according to Ephesians 4.30. He can be insulted according to Hebrews 10.20. He can be resisted. Acts 7, 51, he can be lied to, Acts 5, 1 through 11. Just so you know, all those notes are on our website if you want to see them. He has personal attributes. Therefore, he's a personal being. Now, the Holy Spirit has been working since the beginning of time. His presence and work throughout biblical history is, is loaded in Scripture in fact, two-thirds of the Old Testament books, almost, almost two-thirds of the Old Testament books, the Holy Spirit is mentioned. Almost two-thirds. He's an agent at work on earth in the Old Testament. And the focus in the Old Testament is more of what he did, not who he is. And as you come into the New Testament, all of a sudden he gets more personal and now it's more about who he is in your life. Why would that be? Because now he comes into your life. That's the shift. In the Old Testament, he came upon people. In the New Testament, we see he comes into people and lives and dwells in them, which would make sense why he becomes more personal rather than just a worker around God. But to give you examples of where the Holy Spirit was, the Holy Spirit was at creation. According to Genesis 1-2, the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Wow. And we know in Ephesians 1 and Colossians 1 that all things were created through Christ, so Christ must have been there too. So they were all there in the beginning, creating the world, creating us. The Holy Spirit came upon God's people throughout the Old Testament for, for many specific tasks, like building structures, prophecy, leadership, supernatural strength, like Samson. The Holy Spirit came upon him and gave him strength. The Holy Spirit goes into the New Testament. He was involved in the birth of Christ, the baptism of Christ, the temptation of Christ. He was there strengthening him. The works of Christ, all the healings and all the things, the miracles that Jesus did, the Holy Spirit was present. Even at the death of Christ, according to Hebrews 9, 14. What about the resurrection of Christ? Yes, 1 Peter 3, 18 talks about the power of the Holy Spirit resurrecting Christ. The birth of the church. In 1 Corinthians 12, 13, uh, Galatians 3, 27, Acts 2, he continues to empower the church at Pentecost. The Holy Spirit has been actively involved in Christianity. Why in the world has he been neglected? 
He's more aware of us than we are of him. Well, we'll go into this more about his role in our lives today. And throughout this whole series, we'll learn more and more about how he plays a role in our lives and an important one as well. There are many that we could cover about his role in our lives, but let me just give an introduction, the same one that Jesus gave the disciples. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John 14, and we're going to look at verse 15 through 17. The context here is that Jesus is spending his final time, his final hours with his disciples, and he's going to leave them, but he's not going to leave them alone. He's only going to be absent from them physically, but he's going to be with them through the Holy Spirit. John 14, verse 15 And I just want to put verse one on there real quick and just say this. Verse one, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's home. He's getting ready to go there. And he said, do not be troubled. And here's why. Verse 15, if you love me, obey my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So we see right now that because Jesus is present, the Holy Spirit has not come in his fullness yet in this moment. But when Jesus goes... He's going to send the Holy Spirit to not just be on the believers, but to live inside the believers. And the rest of our series is going to help us understand why and what comes with the Holy Spirit in our lives. John 16, 5 through 7. Just go a couple more or two chapters over, or for me, it's one flip of a paper or page. John 16, five through seven. But now I am going away to the one who sent me. And let me actually read the Amplified version. It's on the screen for you. I love this version. It helps explain what the word advocate means. But now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts and taken complete possession of them. But I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper or comforter, advocate, intercessor, counselor, strengthener, standby, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, the Holy Spirit, to you to be in close fellowship with you. Even Jesus, when he says the word advocate, he's meaning a lot of things. The Holy Spirit is powerful. And it's interesting to me that Jesus would say, I need to go because you need the Holy Spirit. (laughs) I mean, they're friends. They've been together for three years. They've been doing ministry together. They've been through highs and lows. What do you mean you're leaving us? And who's this advocate guy? In the Greek, it's paraclete. And it's translated a comforter, helper, counselor, advocate, And its root meaning is one called to your side. You know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying it's it's, it's if I've never left you, I'm by your side the entire time. Because we learned that the Godhead and the Trinity, they're one. So to have the Holy Spirit is to have God and Jesus with you at all times. Why would this be so important? Now, God is not limited, and neither is Jesus. But Jesus assumed the the human body as well. He took on the human body, and the human body has limitations, but Jesus doesn't. So I want to make sure you hear me so you don't think I'm a false teacher or anything like that. The human body has limitations. Jesus had to go to bed and sleep. Jesus cried. Jesus had to eat. 
He took on a human body so he could identify with us and go through what we went through. He was also fully God at the same time. But he chose not to use all of his power and ability so that we can learn how to live for God and, de- and be dependent on the Holy Spirit as well. Jesus was dependent on the Holy Spirit to teach us how to depend on the Holy Spirit too. That's why he prayed, asking God for help. So I say all that to say that we, sorry, I lost my train of thought on that. (laughs) I'm trying to remind myself why I said that. With the Holy Spirit, we have all of Christ, all of God, and we're never alone. The comfort of God, the counsel, the help, the advocacy. He's our standby in case something happens. He's interceding. And when he goes, he sends the Holy Spirit down. When Jesus goes to heaven, he sends the Holy Spirit down. And we see that in Acts chapter 2 in Pentecost. I'm encouraged by this because this means with the Holy Spirit, comes the continual presence and power of God and Jesus Christ wherever we go. That's where I was headed. Jesus physically could not be everywhere because he assumed the human body. But the church would spread out around the world with the power of Jesus in them. Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. See, Jesus wanted the Holy Spirit to come. One, so he could be with us at all times and live in us. And that his power would spread throughout the world. So the Holy Spirit is a missional spirit too. Not just an internal spirit for us. The Holy Spirit is God, you ready for this? From this scripture, what we learn is the Holy Spirit is God keeping his promise to never leave us. You can put that on the screen for us. The Holy Spirit is God keeping his promise to never leave us. He did say that. He said, I would never leave you, nor forsake you. Well, how is that possible? Through the power of the Holy Spirit through the presence of God, being with them. God loves you so much, he stays with you through the Holy Spirit. (laughs) That's how much he loves you. I know that's really simple. I know we went into the deep end and now we're coming out of the shallow end here. But can we just think about that for a moment? God loves you so much, he's that close. He lives in you through his Holy Spirit. If you feel unloved today, you don't have to. You can invite Jesus Christ into your life through the presence of the Holy Spirit. God comes to be in you, to have a relationship with you. He is not just a cosmic God that is far away from us. He is close to home. He's right here. Praise the Lord for that. And the Holy Spirit is God with us and in us to be our comforter, counselor, and strength. And man, have I needed him in the past two years. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, Lord, please help me to not do that or say that. He's my counselor. He's like, you don't need to do that. Oh, Lord, I'm hurting. I'm discouraged. He's my comforter. Lord, I don't know what to do. The Holy Spirit's my intercessor. God, I'm a little concerned, a little scared of what I need to do today. He's my standby. I am never alone. Let's stay in the shallow end for a moment. We're never alone. Now, that can come with some sobering thoughts of that God sees everything, but it can also come with some comfort too, can it? And the Holy Spirit is holy. 
And so there are things that he sees that he won't like because we can offend him and hurt him, but he's also a comforter as well to comfort us in our time of need. So let me close with this. I really just want to lay down a simple foundation today of who the Holy Spirit is, that he is God in spirit, and that he's personal, and we should refer to him as he and not it. And just so you know, I pray to the Holy Spirit. I say, Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, help me. I don't treat him as a force, you know. (laughs) I don't wield a lightsaber anyway or anything like that. I don't ask him to pick things up or anything. In fact, I was praying to him this morning, just saying, be with me. I know you're there. Help me be aware that you're there. Help me to notice your presence. Help me to feel and experience your presence today. We're told, now this is, this is what we're going to be covering in our series. We're told that God can change anyone. We're told that once we encounter the saving power of Jesus, we're never the same again. We're told God would never leave us and is with us. We're told that God comforts and helps us. We're told God will lead and guide us through this life. We've been told that we can do greater things than we realize. We're told that we can be powerful witnesses for Christ in this world. We're also told that we can heal, have supernatural insight, wisdom, and discernment, faith, and many other gifts. We're told we can be full of love, joy, peace, kindness, and self-control. We're told greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. We're told who the Son sets free is free indeed. We're told that God finishes what he starts. How is this all possible? Scripture says, through the Holy Spirit. So in case our church or anyone here doesn't know how God does all that, it is through the Holy Spirit. I am believing and praying that God awakens you and helps you see the Holy Spirit in a whole new way this this next uh, season together in this series. You're going to be, he's going to be your best friend. (laughs) The Holy Spirit is God being with you as your best friend. And man, does he care what you're going through. God cares what you're going through. Two more takeaways. The Holy Spirit enables us to have a spiritual, holy and fruitful life with God. The Holy Spirit enables us to have a spiritual, holy, and fruitful life with God. That's what we're going to discover. But here's the thing. Without the Holy Spirit, none of that exists. You can't have a spiritual life. You can't be made holy. You can't be holy without the Holy Spirit in you. And the only reason why we have a fruitful life is because the Holy Spirit works in us and through us. But if you do not have the Holy Spirit, it's because you need to put your faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm praying that, first of all, for us believers, that God will help us to be more aware of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That we would know the person, the presence, and the power of God that lives in us. You really are more powerful than you think with God's presence in you. We know who the Holy Spirit is now. We have a a basic understanding of who the Holy Spirit is now. But does he know who you are in a personal way? Think about that for a moment. In fact, why don't we close our eyes for a moment so we can pray. Does the Holy Spirit know you? Well, of course he does, but does he know you in a personal way? Do you have a relationship with God or do you need Jesus? Do you need to have a relationship with all of God? Does he live in you? Because he wants to. And if he doesn't, the only way that that can happen is trusting in Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Trusting in Jesus to be the Lord of your life and the Savior from your sin is the only way that that would change today is God living in you. Maybe God has been drawing you this entire service. 
Maybe God has been convincing you and convicting you of things that are wrong in your life and that you need him to save you. He's doing that because he wants to save you today. God loves you. And you can put your trust in Christ right now by praying this prayer or praying a prayer from your heart saying, Lord, I see my sin. I see that I need Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And your word says that you forgive me because of the cross. So I receive your forgiveness today. I believe that you come and live in me through your Holy Spirit and change me from this day forward. And may I live to serve you, to give my all to you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer or any prayer like it, would you tell whoever you came with, would you tell one of our ushers, one of our greeting team, our host team in the lobby, we want to connect with you and talk to you about it and just celebrate with you too. Even those online, let us know. That's just the beginning of the journey and the Holy Spirit is with you now. Church, thank you so much for being here today and for being hungry for the word of God. It has the power to save, doesn't it? God's word is alive and active and we're so grateful for it. Let me do a quick prayer for you as you go. Lord, be with us. And we know now you are with us through faith in Christ and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for giving your all to us. And we want more of your Holy Spirit because there's more. There's more power. And there's more understanding. And there's more faith in walking in step with the Holy Spirit. So God, increase it. May we grow closer to you through this series. And help us now to respect you and the wholeness of you, all of you. Lord, we thank you for your personal presence with us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.